You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's up, everyone? Thanks for listening and welcome to a brand new episode of my Straight to Video podcast. Many people who know me know how much I love just outright great pop music. Laney fodder, as it's often been described. So today's chat was a real treat for me as I got to speak to two of the 80s finest songwriters who penned several of the decade's biggest hits, including one of my all-time favorite songs. On today's show, I speak with George Merrill and Shannon Rubicam, who you will probably know best as the incredible pop duo Boy Meets Girl. Their late 80s smash it Waiting for a Star to Fall, in my opinion, is simply pop perfection. And if any song can capture a feeling and brighten any mood, then it is this one. To this day, I never tire of it, and it really capped the greatest pop culture decade we'll ever see. What some of you might not know, though, is that George and Shannon are equally successful as songwriters for other artists, most notably for penning How Will I Know and I Want to Dance with Somebody, which launched the career of Whitney Houston. Perhaps most importantly, though, is that I was delighted to find out they're both two lovely souls who gave one of the most relaxed and fun interviews I've had on this show so far, so I know you're going to love hearing from them. This Straight to Video podcast, as always, is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, an incredible piece of photo editing software which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. It's used to create the podcast episode artwork you see each week with the video covers, and it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. So please, if you get a chance, check them out at affinity.serif.com. All right, Shannon and George continue to write and record as Boy Meets Girl to this day. And you can check out their latest album, Five, which is out now. And there's talk of more songs in the near future, along with some older material, hopefully surfacing too. For all you need to know, check out boymeetsgirlmusic.com and follow them on all the social media platforms. We chat about so much in this conversation. And when I tell them we could easily do part two or three, I wasn't exaggerating as there's so much to their story. For now, though, please enjoy this wonderful straight to video chat with George Merrill and Shannon Rubicam of Boy Meets Girl. It's nice to see you. It's nice to look into your eyes. Quick question. Why does it look dark outside? Because I'm in the same country that you are. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) I'm in Senan, Cornwall right now. Oh, fantastic. Senan Cove, yeah. Excellent stuff. What are you doing there? You're songwriting? My wife, Rosalind, was taking art classes up in St. Ives, and we had a, a little bit of time afterwards, so we came down here, and she found a funky little place, and so we're enjoying ourselves down here for a bit. It looks really, really nice. It looks quite regal. I know. I'm kind of feeling like I, I was... <laughs> Roz was just mentioned, I kind of feel like Alistair Cook, you know, tonight at Masterpiece Theatre. Exactly. Yeah, you need some <laughs> cigars next to you or something, a little glass of whiskey. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, exactly. We both have always been Anglophiles and always so appreciated. There are so many things that I appreciate about this country. The size of it, it causes people to be more of a collective and not quite as disparate as I feel back home. Some of those things. Well, I'm up in Nottingham. I don't know if you've ventured that far north. I was going to ask where you are in the country. So you're up in Nottingham. Okay, gotcha. I know Nottingham because actually Shannon and I used to work with Elliot Kennedy up at Steelworks up in Sheffield quite a bit. We would write with his boy and girl bands back in the 90s. One of them, they cut a song called Story of Love and they were called OTT. They were short lived. They weren't like, uh, you know, they weren't take that or anything like that. (laughs) Hi, Shannon. How are you? Okay, I'm here. There she is. Hi, Rob. How's it going, Shannon? Nice to meet you. Good. Nice to meet you, too. You guys are both in the UK. That was my first question. I was like, why is it dark outside? I know. I know. What's the story? What's the story here? Shannon, good hair day. Oh, good. I had to go all around the house to find a place where the sun wasn't, like, making all these crazy shadows on my face. So... It's fine. I think I'm good here. Looks good. So whereabouts are you, Shannon? I'm in Northern California. And let's see. Out there, all the oak trees and the deer have been wandering by all morning and it's pretty nice. So what's been the two of you's relationship with the UK over the years? Obviously, George is here now and is it somewhere you'd like to visit or when did you first come over? We 
have a great relationship with the UK because I think we first came over when we were in Denise Williams' background band. We spent, I think we made a couple of trips over there. We spent a good deal of time in London and then on her van bus traveling around. We'd hold up at the London Metropole on Edgware Road and then we'd take bus (laughs) trips out to little towns like Boston and we'd head down to, oh my gosh, we went out to Wales. I remember going to Cardiff and so a number of different places. We played the Hammersmith Odeon. Was this all prior to um, when Waiting for a Star to Fall broke? Yeah, this was was, back there. Was it like 79, 80, 81, somewhere in there? Wow, we're going right back then. Yeah. Yeah. I was London back then, though, when you was coming in. That must have been really cool around that time. It was. It was a very cool time. Yeah. The music scene was really exciting. I think one of the things that really lit us about and gave us hope about pop music in general was the music was coming out the other side of punk and the more aggressive side of things. And Shannon and I, you know, we just tended to be pop writers. And so along came Boy George and Karma Chameleon and things like that. It was like it gave us hope. It's like, oh, melody, you know, and some of those things that were a little easier in our wheelhouse, you know, and so we felt like we might have a place in the music business again. So was it all kind of like Virgin in kind of the new romantic, new wave thing around that time, or would that be a little bit later on? It was a a little bit of that, yeah, and I think it was actually early 80s, like maybe 81 or two. We had just moved to California, so yeah, it was exciting being in London, though. I loved it, and just you know, we headed out the door of the hotel and started walking during the days, you know, yeah. walking everywhere. And then we'd jump on the van later and go to whatever the venue was. And so we got to see quite a lot of it. And then we did, um, when we were promoting for Boy Meets Girl, we were in London a few times also. We um, spent months at a time over. Was it January 1989 you were on Top of the Pops? Oh, good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did some fact checking. I've not like, got that good a memory. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. It was our life. I don't remember. But um, except I do remember Top of the Pops. That was so much fun. Oh, it was so cool. Once we realized the import of it in the UK, that people would sit down. This is what we were told. People would sit down at dinner and the family would watch it because it was at that hour, broadcast at that hour. And so, yeah, that was really fun. We enjoyed it. Yeah, it really was. I think you were both on the same episode as Milli Vanilli. I think oh. we might have been in, in uh, Tanita <laughs> Tickerum. Tanita right, Tickerum. Tanita Tickerum. She, was, she had a song called Something in My Sobriety. Forget that <laughs> one. Sobriety. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah the, how was it at the BBC for that? Did you get many run throughs of the song or was it just like one take and away you went? No, I think we just did one. You know, it was lip syncing, yeah. of course. We did one take. And then I can't remember which show it was, but we were on with uh, Mike and the Mechanics. And we were big fans of The Living Years. That song was huge over here. And that, that must have been around 89, 90 time, I would imagine. Was it a bit before that? Yeah. It was. Yeah. And so it was yeah. fun to encounter them here and there on the various shows and hear that song again and get to tell them how much we loved it. Yeah, we had some some backstage time with them, you know, in between gigs and that sort of thing. And it was good fun. I'm going to go out on a limit, but I watched the Top of the Pops appearance. The band who you perform with, they didn't look very American. They look very British. <laughs> they, were, they were. I think we collected bands wherever we went because right. it was a lip sync yeah. tour. Yeah. You know, we had our friends and our studio guys that we played with in California, but we didn't have the budget to take them along and it wasn't a live music tour. So we had the Italian backup band and the Southern UK backup band and the Wales backup band and the (laughs) German backup band. (laughs) The first thing that you'd do is you'd go meet the sax player because he started everything off, you know. So you'd go, you'd got to check him out and make sure that he kind of knew what to do. And Oh, that was great. The guy who was playing sax on that Top of the Pops period, he wanted center stage on that one. You could tell. Oh, yes. oh yeah. It was his moment. <laughs> sax players don't get those kind of moments very often, you know, unless you're like Kenny G or something. Exactly, I guess. exactly. You're both known as like amazing songwriters, but is touring something you enjoyed? You began as performers, but was touring something you took to when the band began receiving success? Did you like being out on the road performing or was it a lot of hard work? You know, it coincided with having an infant daughter at the time. So that complicated a little. And I know that these days people tour with their kids all the time. But at that time, it wasn't the case. And so we scrambled a little to have a setup where we could either leave our daughter, which was a little painful, or 
bring her with us. But also, I think we discovered that we're really studio rats. We did a lot of playing live before we got a record deal, years and years of it. And some people are born performers, and we can certainly do that, but I don't think it's innate to both of us necessarily. It isn't our first love. (laughs) Yeah, I would concur. You know, there are some people that have that muscle, and they loved it to write a song so they can get out and Right. Like you can't keep Lady Gaga or Bruce Springsteen off the road or Madonna, you know, it's who they are. Yeah. Part of writing the song is to write it so that you can deliver it. Absolutely. Who else was in your touring band when you was out on the road? You say you had like regular West Coast people or did that change quite a bit or did you have some go-tos? To back up a little bit, you know, when you talk about touring bands in the Denise Williams band, we had the honor to have as our drummer, we had Raymond Pounds. Raymond Pounds was the drummer for Stevie Wonder, you know, so it's like it was so cool to be able to like play with him live night after night. You know, we had a lot of fun together and we did some really great performances. That was a lot of fun. I think with Boy Meets Girl, it was that video age. So we rarely had moments, you know, where we had a whole band and it all came together. I think we had a few fleeting moments up in Seattle. We were there with some of our mates because we're both from Seattle. And so we got together and did some performances and that sort of thing. But for the most part, it's funny because later on, after we did our records and we had some time away from it, Shannon and I came back to just sitting down to the piano and singing kind of like we started out doing. We have really enjoyed kind of breaking it down and doing versions of our songs in a raw sort of way. Just the song, the voice. Yeah. Yeah, I know all the guitar. Yeah. Exactly. And we still really enjoy having those moments. But that whole mechanism, that whole juggernaut that you have to put together and the time it takes. There are other people that are really good at that. I want rather with the time I have left. I want <laughs> I want to write the next song that I haven't dreamt up yet. You mentioned Seattle there. Is that where you was both born and raised? Mm-hmm. I know that's where you both met, but is that where you grew up? I didn't move out of Seattle till I was 30, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we came down to Southern California to play clubs a few times before that, but it was quite a while before we moved down because we just thought, you know, we've got to do that now or never really get down there to where the music scene is and try our chances, you know. What was it like in Seattle? I mean, you grew up in like the late 60s and 70s. That just in general is such an amazing time for music. Who were the artists you were kind of looking up to? And was there anyone in Seattle that was a big influence? Oh my gosh. You answered. <laughs> well, uh, well, actually, there was a really great live music scene. It was kind of folk pop and lots of venues that people would go and actually hang out and listen. So it was a great singer songwriter time. We happened in Seattle to be in a perfect situation for who we wanted to be as young uh, developing artists. We had actually listening rooms where we could sit down and play. There were a lot of really good bands in Seattle, but this is pre-grunge. This is before Soundgarden and Nirvana and all that. That all kind of kicked in pretty much. That all happened. Waiting for a Star to Fall happened. And then the spigot got turned off on pop music and then came Nirvana. (laughs) And and then we had the 90s. And I have to say, I, I was thrilled to hear the musicality of what was coming out of Seattle. And the power of it, the emotion, it was... And that it was really a whole sort of cohesive, um, coherent movement. There was a style to it. You know, it was grunge. And, oh, yeah. You know, perhaps born of the, <laughs> the weather there and just a feeling in the air, I would say, and of those times. So, but yeah. that's when we were already down in Los Angeles. So we weren't so much associated with that. What was the first thing you heard? Was it seeing Nirvana on MTV or did you have some friends still back home who said, things are kicking off up here? <laughs> <What was> <laughs> You know, we had a few I, studio engineer friends who were very much aware of what was going on in Seattle. But I think, yeah, we first got hip to it through MTV, probably listening to the videos. And I, MTV I had, was such a thing in the late 80s. It was brand new and exciting and interesting. And everybody was yeah. experimenting with all of this newness. <laughs> Yeah, there was a I took a raft trip down the Grand Canyon in the early 90s. And we were down there for 23 days and we had brought music along with us. And we brought instruments too. We we actually set up and played music on the way down. But there was a cassette tape that we had along with us. And it was never mind. Every day we'd get up and we'd row to, you know, Nirvana's album. And it's like I really got familiar with the musicality of it. So it was great. It was a great, um, you know, I always tie that album to that trip, you know. Totally murder. 
conversion, we call that. <laughs> it was. What did you hear in Nirvana's music? Obviously, being from Seattle, what did you hear? Did you hear the pop melodies in it or did you hear the angst in it? Or what was it that kind of caught your ear? All of it. I liked the quality of Kurt Cobain's voice. You know, I liked all the rough edges of it. And then it was surprisingly melodic. You could perform any of their songs with just a guitar and a voice, and they translated beautifully, and you could certainly hear some desperation in it. Am I mistaken? Wasn't it Butch Vig that produced Nevermind? I think it I was. Think so, yeah, yeah. And how he corralled and, you know, how he brought the music, and he really was so responsible for creating the sound of it. I mean... You know, Kurt's brilliance and as far as, you know, stretching the limits of musical reality is one thing, you know, and lyrically and everything like that, and expression of angst and everything. But it's funny, it's like, I laughed when you said that because the first thing I thought was hoquium. <laughs> Because we know the Northwest and we know that little funky town that Kurt came out of. And it's like, oh, man, it's understandable that if that was at your core, where some of this might have come out of. Yeah, true. And I've forgotten about that. Yeah, it's on the really right in the fog bank, <laughs> yes. Washington. And that could bring your spirits down a bit and also make you quite introspective. And it's crazy. Like, I don't know if it makes us sound old or not, but for me, like, even when I hear that stuff, like over 30 years years later it still sounds fresh yeah yeah it's yeah. crazy I was into all like the late 80s, early 90s hard rock bands, which were still around with the massive images stuff. That's what made me want to be in a band. So I was like, damn, they took away my music. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> even now, just hearing the grunge stuff, it's like, it still sounds so exciting. Yeah. yeah. And it, that might be partly due to just the, it seems like it was recorded in a really raw way and it's not overly embellished. So it really doesn't have so much a time period when you hear it in your heart. You know, it just hits you where it was meant to hit you. The one big difference I would just say is that we started out talking about the punk and the new wave time. And, and a lot of those records were recorded so horribly. It was just edgy. And it's like it was meant to cause. That's really part of what that was. But I think what I love so much about what I guess it is Butch Vig or else <laughs> I better get my facts straight. But I'm, I'm going to give him all the credit. But the band and Butch coming together to create this new sound that actually it's all at once musical too. It's like all those tones, all those guitars mean something. Every one of those bass lines means something. So it's actually very musical, but it's very powerful. That to me is at the heart of my musicality because even though I started out listening to Elton John and I was inspired by the Beatles and such simple, melodic, beautiful songs, it was Led Zeppelin that just started really moving me. And, and 10 years after, and the more prog rock of Jethro Tull and things like that, it's like I would go way inside on all those records and, and try to figure out how they did them. I love the musicality of searing electric guitars, but having it be recorded in this beautiful thing, you know, this beautiful, powerful thing. How about you, Shannon? What was the first music that kind of blew your mind? I would have to say it was Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell, really. I loved both their lyrics their melodies, and again, their universality, even though they write really, really personal music. So those two, I would like, that's where I would get an album, lock myself in the music room, lie down on the floor with a speaker on each <laughs> ear, you know, just right down there, and read the lyrics and listen to the whole album through, turn it over, listen to the other side, you know, so have that full experience. And then the Beach Boys, because their harmonies, their melodies, their songs, they're such perfect jewels, each one of them. So yeah. um, I think really those were some formative times. And also Jimi Hendrix, he had gone to my high school a few years before me and came to one of our assemblies one day. What? Yeah. <laughs> he, just, he was very stoned and really not at his best that day. Was that a big deal for Did everybody know he was coming along? Yeah, we'd heard there was some buzz in the hall, you know. <laughs> So everybody, and especially those people who didn't normally show up for assemblies, you know, they were out smoking somewhere. Everybody was there. But it was kind of a disappointment because he was not at his best at that moment, 
were really not coherent. So they ended up, our principal had to walk him, you know, out of the assembly. But we were all thrilled to see him. And, you know, of course, he's a Seattle person and indelibly etched in the history of music, you know. <laughs> That's incredible. You mentioned like the harmonies of the Beach Boys and stuff like that. George, you had the band Sparrow, which Shannon would eventually join when you wanted a third vocal harmony. What kind of style of music was you doing back then? Was it like singer songwriter thing or was you going for like a big sound with all the harmonies and stuff like that? Was that super important for you? It was super important. Yeah. <laughs> My writing partner at the time, David Lindquist, we met each other in the second grade and in the fifth grade in school. He was John Lennon and I was Paul McCartney. Right. In our first band, the, it was called The Village Sunshine. We wrote a song probably because we saw the monkeys at this point, you know, it's because a little bit later. And they had, hey, hey, with the monkeys. But we had, <laughs> then came the village sunshine, yeah, and made your life worthwhile. Then came the village sunshine, yeah, and made your life a little brighter, yeah, brighter, <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty cool song, actually. I love how you just pulled that from the memory banks. I know. <laughs> and you know what? I haven't sung that song in 50 years. <laughs> Do you remember the first place you sang that song? Uh, it was at Mrs. Berg's. She was the teacher. And yeah, and she had a, an after party. And she invited us to come sing. And I, and I remember that was the one place that that song ever got performed. <laughs> and then on this podcast. <laughs> and well, yeah, I guess so. That's true. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. What was it that eventually led you both down to Los Angeles? Was it as Boy Meets Girl or was it to pursue a recording career or was it specifically for songwriting? It was just George and I. We just had that. Well, actually, we were in Seattle and the clouds were hanging low yeah. and it wasn't raining. And, you know, the positive ions were building up. It had been gray for months. And we had this wonderful friend who's still a wonderful friend and we call him our fame guide. He he had a studio that he had just opened on Coenga Boulevard in Los Angeles for advertising. And so we said, we're thinking of coming down because we just need to get out of Seattle. And then we also need to see if we can make a name for ourselves. And so he said, well, I will give you enough work to last you six months. So while you get yourselves going in town, I'll give you some ad work. So we went down, moved to Tarzana and this funky little place in Los Angeles in the valley. We had a donkey living next door and some chickens. We did. And <laughs> we did. Can't believe that that would be in Los Angeles, but there you have it. Little street. And then our friend Jim Bredo did give us enough ad work, which worked out brilliantly. So so we decided to stay and we were sending out cassette tapes just as the two of us. We were trying to think of a name for our band, but we didn't have one at the time. So we sent cassette tapes out and our tape ended up in a bin at a and Records. And they actually pulled the tape out of the bin and listened to it and called up one day. And George answered the phone, which was a landline then, of course. And um, I heard him in the hallway. And all of a sudden, you know, his like his voice went up a few notches. <laughs> oh, hi. I remember yeah. thinking, oh, that must be a good phone call. Who <laughs> was on the other end of the phone? His name was Aaron Jacobus. You know, we remain friends with Aaron. There's a little side note. I thought his name was Alan Jalakis. And so on the envelope, we had written in a records care of Alan Jalakis. And that's one of the reasons why he called. He was laughing on the other end. He said, this is Alan. And uh, we got your music here. By the way, my name is Aaron Jacobus. <laughs> so I'm, I'm red faced kind of going, oh, I blew this one, you know. But as it turns out, that's what caught his eye to see yeah. that. And then, and then they yeah. popped it in and they liked the music. How crazy is that? If you'd have crossed the T's and dotted the I's correctly. It might have been a whole different story. I know. There's 20 cassette tapes in there. I don't want to listen yeah. to any of them, you know. <laughs> yeah. But Aaron was, um, I think he was a pretty new hire at A&M for their A&R department at the time. And so he was looking for a project that he could guide personally. And so we ended up being that project for him, which was delightful. You know, really good fortune for us. What year would this have been? 1984 or five. Three, four, five. Eight, four and five, yeah. What was like Hollywood like back then? What jumps to mind? Oh, I remember oh. what was the band that we were so lit about. We loved Nobody Missing Persons. We missing were... Persons. Yeah. Oh, 
You know, I think part of us of wanted to punk rock band, punk rock pop band. Yeah. Really good. We yeah. were having so life much fun so hearing live music. When you don't Sorry. know what you're going to do. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. God, they were cool. Sunset Boulevard must have been alive around that time then. Oh, it was fun. Yeah. 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 All it was kinds very of cool. music in small and large venues. Oh, and one time we were listening to, I think we'd gone to somewhere like the Pantages or something, and ABC yeah. was playing. Do you know that band, yeah, yeah. Rob? Look of Love. Look of the Love. Look of love. <laughs> yeah. That's the look. They were playing, and for some reason, George and I were standing way in the back, and George nudges me and says, don't look to your right. And, of course, I look to my right, (laughs) and Prince is standing there. (laughs) In a trench coat, and he's like five feet tall. And he's right beside his big body. Yeah, his big bodyguard. And so it was, it was kind of cool because it was a kind of a sparse audience to see ABC, which I was kind of surprised about. But, you know, there he was standing right next to us. It was very cool. Unreal. <laughs> and they were, oh, man, they were so awesome. The sound of all their syndromes and things like that, you know, they had the coolest sound. And a lot of that was very inspirational for us. And Prince, actually, if you listen to Purple Rain and everything that he's done at that mm-hmm. time, you know. How did you end up getting on Clive Davis's radar and eventually being in a position to be submitting songs for other artists? Along with being signed to AM Records, we were also signed to Elmo Irving Publishing at the time. Lance Freed was the head of it. And he called us in. And I think Aaron introduced us to him, Aaron Jacobus. And so we had a meeting at Lance Freed's office and he signed us to publishing. We came in there with our little one month old daughter because <laughs> you know, we didn't know anybody in LA at the time and pretty much just gotten there. So we had a meeting, he signed us, and then they told us at one point they were looking for music for Janet Jackson. So we wrote How Will I Know, and it was very light and airy, which had been her sound up to that point. But as it turned out, she was working on her Control album, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. And so that was a whole completely different yeah, sound. Definitely. Did that have what have you done for me lately on there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A bit more attitude and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. totally yeah. great album. So that cassette went away, I guess. And then Brenda Andrews was approached by Jerry Griffiths for Arista Record because they were looking for music for this young singer unknown called Whitney Houston. And so Brenda played the song for Jerry Griffiths and he loved it and took it to Clive. And then it made the rounds of different producers and ended up with Narda Michael Walden, who eventually produced the song, which was called How Will I Know? Be honest, if you're comfortable to do so. Was it a bit of a downer that Janet Jackson had turned it down and you was like, it's going to go to unknown artists? Not a downer, but I mean, yeah. But we obviously, I mean, we were excited about writing for Janet Jackson and, you know, Sissy Houston, we thought, well, you know, maybe Whitney Houston's going to be kind of doing more of a jazz thing or whatever. We didn't really understand what they were thinking of doing. But Heck, these were the early days of our publishing world. And so we were excited to be part of anything at that point. Yeah, I say no one was prepared for what Whitney Houston would become. No No one was ready for that. We hadn't heard her, so we had no idea. And really, honestly, at the time that they asked us to write it, we were working on, I think, our first album for Boy Meets Girl. And that was really our focus, because we'd always imagined that we would be (laughs) songwriter, singers, recording artists. And we hadn't really spent too much time considering that it might be publishing, you know, and songwriting for others that took us farthest out into the world. And so that was really our focus. So when I was, you know, shaking my head, we weren't that disappointed. It was because we <laughs> we were really focused on our own album. But then we heard, you know, How Will I Know over the phone when it was roughly mixed. So we heard a rough mix that friends had done in Narda studio. They called us up on the phone and played it. You got to hear this. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, you hear something like that and you go, oh, well, <laughs> I never imagined this and I wasn't picturing this. And oh, my God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, you know how earlier we were talking about Nirvana, it was like everything conspired, you know, between Whitney's brilliance and Narada's production and such. We were definitely part of something really unusual and special. And I look back on that time and I think, 
well, we got ourselves there. We have to give ourselves that, you know, and we did the work. We did the work as far as the song and that sort of thing. But, you know, it, it doesn't always work out. And the fact that we were there at those moments, I still marvel at all of that, really. How is it for the two of you as songwriters presenting a demo, then hearing it produced, potentially changed and altered, and you hear the finished result? Is that exciting? Do you have to trust the producer and the artist once you hand that song over? Oh, yeah. You know, unless they are going to invite you into the studio, and I know that some songwriters do go into the studio and help out, but I think we never did. So once you hand it off, you kind of have to let go. It was really hard at first. You know, of course, How Will I Know became an immensely better song because of it. So that was a good outcome. But really, we were in the process of learning that once you give it to someone else, it really is their song. And they're going to do what they're going to do with it, for better or for worse. You know, we just got really as lucky as you can get, (laughs) handing a song off to someone else, you know, to a whole group of other people, because they... They applied their talents and it just became this other musical force, really. How Will I Know was followed up with I Want to Dance with Somebody on Whitney's next album. Did I read you hand-delivered a demo cassette to Clive Davis just as he was getting on a plane? Yeah, we were recently asked about that and we actually had a phone call with Clive Davis about three weeks ago. How do you remember this? <laughs> he called up and he was. He said, I know this happened, but how did everything kind of come together? And it was fun because it had been so long. But between Shannon and Clive and I, we kind of put the story together. We'd been asked to write the song for, you know, a second song for Whitney. And so we got to work on it. We finished the song. We felt confident of it. We wanted to get it to him. We called him up and he said, well, I'm heading to the airport. And I said, well, we live close to the airport. We could probably run out there and bring it to you. Well, then why don't you come out and uh, meet me at the gate? You know, those are things that you can't even say anymore. (laughs) You You, you certainly can't meet anyone at the gate anymore. (laughs) Right. And so I ran through the airport. We lived roughly eight minutes from the airport. We were very close down in Venice, California. I just, you know, tore out there. (laughs) Actually, you know, I I ran out to the gate. It was uh, Transworld Airlines, TWA, which doesn't exist anymore. There he's standing with his briefcase handed him the cassette, and he said, great, I'll have a listen on the plane. And I said to him something, forget, I said something like, we were, you know, getting ready to record. Were we already starting to record for, or I think we were just looking for songs for Boy Meets Girl. So I said to him, I, you know, we may want to hold on to this one for ourselves. And he had some choice words for me, but in a friendly way. <laughs> The song was recently voted Billboard's best pop song of the Hot 100 era. We just found out about that. Yeah. I disagree a little in that song's ranking. Yeah, it's pretty good. But for me, Waiting for a Star to Fall is probably the greatest, unashamedly brilliant, pure pop song of all time. Oh, my God. My goodness. You've you've totally won our hearts. (laughs) Wow. I mean, I'm a rock guy, so a lot of my favorite songs are guitar heavy. But when it comes to pure melody... That one, like, takes the crown. It's ah. Wilson Phillips' Hold On is up there. It yeah. is. Yeah. Which came a couple of years after. It's a yeah. beautiful melody, yeah. But yours comes with a music video with that lovely late 80s, early 90s golden sheen, which has yes, a one place in my heart as well. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, I love the, that. The beaches of Venice and Malibu, you know, are highlighted in that. There was a golden sheen. <laughs> was the song a smash right out of the gate or like what you mentioned earlier? Was marketing as much of a play in it getting heard? MTV, a particular radio station. I mean, having a great song, that's just like the first part of the puzzle sometimes. Yeah, we were at BMG Records at the time and Paul Atkinson was our a r person. And, Guitar player uh, for the had, zombies, I might add. Yes, right. And we had a really nice... Nice connection with him. So I think we actually had his dedication for marketing that song. And yeah, it takes a lot of marketing to make a song a hit because there's so much competition and you're buying radio time or you're paying your way there or however it was working at the time. And I don't even know about now. So yeah, we got the attention of the record company on that song and it worked its way, I think, reasonably quickly up the charts. I think we reached number five here in the United States, and it got a lot of play. I mean, we started getting calls from friends. I just heard your song. I saw it on MTV. I was in the grocery store. I was driving in my car, you know. So, yeah, we got a little bit of that, and Kiss FM radio played it in yeah. Los Angeles. You yeah, know, so were, when you playing. get the attention of the key DJs at the key radio stations, that 
really gave us a boost. And George has said before, and it's true, that intro allows for a radio DJ to do their pre-announcement about who the band is or whatever they want to say before, and then boom, the song comes in. So it's a good sort of background intro for an announcer, you know. (laughs) When a song like that is coming together in the studio, is it almost easy, like things just fall into place, if that makes any sense to you? It's like, we're on a roll here. It's just working. Yeah, I would say the songwriting of that one, the studio recordings, the as I think about the vocal work that we did, the backing vocals, we have our Lucky Charm backing vocal singer friend, Susan Boyd. She sang the backing vocals for I Want to Dance with Somebody for the demo, the backing mm-hmm. vocals for How Will I Know for the demo, and also Waiting for a Star to Fall. She's the secret weapon. She's she the is. secret <laughs> weapon. And, uh, and so to Susan, we owe a, a debt of gratitude, certainly. Yeah, she gave those background vocals a real boost. She has a more powerful voice, certainly, than I do and matched George's, so that was good. <laughs> All these years later, tell us about what's happening with Boy Meets Girl today because people can hear your latest album, Five, which is out now. Originally an EP, I believe, but now expanded to a full release. But have you been archiving a bunch of older material as well? Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's weird. A song that I co-wrote with Danny O'Keefe, he's from Seattle. He's the responsible for Good Time Charlie's Got the Blues. Yeah, we wrote a song called Next to You, and Sheena Easton recorded it back in about 1990 or 91 or something. And I hadn't heard the song in it forever. I went back through the archives, found the song, and heard her version again, you know. And it was great. Archiving is so much fun because you go back and kind of like what we're doing here, you you know, you put yourself back in that time of cassettes and VHS tapes and all that stuff. You know, it's just such a different world than it is today. And the other song that I remembered that I archived recently was a song called Bring Me Home that we'd written. And Paul Young sang it. I'd completely forgotten about that. But those were some of our early covers that we had before the meteoric, you know, went in Houston. But so, those were yeah, some we, of our early songs. Well, and we're thinking about bringing some of those just a little bit up to date, not re-recording them, but maybe enhancing them and making additional tracks to them where that's possible, technically, really. But we're thinking of bringing some of them forward and just having an archive little EP release or something. Or a series of, you know, here are a few songs from this era and here are a few songs from this era. And leave them more or less in their demo form, but enhance them a little and remix. Yeah, we're proud of some of those old demos and finding them in the archives like this. It's really a treat for us to hear. I don't know, it might just be sort of a geeky thing, but I got a feeling like a few other people (laughs) might think that it was good fun as well. There's some live appearances I've seen with you. George just doing like piano stuff and things like that. I mean, have you ever like done stuff in like a really stripped down format on recordings? Yeah, I think some of the latest things that we're doing right now, we have a a couple of new songs that we're writing. And I can imagine on our latest one, I can imagine doing something like that very much. And maybe just doing two versions, one a little more produced and then one broken down to guitar or keyboards or whatever it's going to be. I think we'll just be having some studio fun. You know, George is back and forth in the UK so we'll have to catch him when he's in his California studio. (laughs) But that's kind of what we're looking forward to most immediately, is just putting out some old and new songs and keeping it pretty simple and, you know, personal. Yeah, we're still enjoying the writing and we're excited about this new stonking idea that we got just before I headed out. So, you know, I can't wait to get back to that and finish it off with Shannon too. It's great. Well, I don't want to keep you much longer, but I'm going to wrap things up with one last question. We've been doing lots of time traveling. I'm going to do one last dip back there. I want you to time travel to a Friday night in the late 80s or early 90s and you head into the video store. What movie soundtrack do you have on the Walkman and what three tapes are you going to rent for the weekend? (laughs) Uh, i'll tell you that's a stump worthy question okay (laughs) it was here's my list yeah i want to hear your list (laughs) my three movies that that i would be carrying home from the video store would be aliens that was 86 you know that was one of my first like shocking horror movies i'd seen (laughs) oh i still um, remember standing up in the theater Oh, my God. In that part where it comes right out of his chest and stuff. I remember standing up and I, I went, no way. <laughs> just like, really, yeah, just like, it was we just both like, stood up. We thought we would leave the theater because we were so, like, shocked by it. But then we yeah. sat down and stayed. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it's aliens and then fatal attraction, you know, because the bunny oh, boiler. Yeah. <laughs> the bunny boiler. And then um, in 1992, The Crying Game. Oh, yeah, good one. movie. And just really took you on this interior journey where you're, you know, the questions are flying. I liked that. And then soundtrack, well, we had a young child in the house, so really <laughs> what came to mind was The Little Mermaid. <laughs> I think you're the second person to choose that. Someone chose that one recently as well. <laughs> and they're well, really good songs, which is why it sticks yeah, in my yeah. mind. But we were hearing a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, over and over. Yeah. So you also got to choose Three Men and a Little Lady soundtrack. That would have been a, a bit of a shoe on. Well, I remember we did listen to it, but again, that turns out to be a little bit more like work. Yeah. So we probably, yeah, we probably shied away from that one. <laughs> well, I have a list. Let's see. Go for it. Let's go. Dead Poets Society, 1989. Oh, yes. Robin Williams. That was an amazing one that came back to mind. And Sleepless in Seattle, 1993. That kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier as far as Nirvana and that whole thing. Because like Sleepless in Seattle, I remember seeing that, you know, it was kind of cool because Seattle was becoming known. Part of the grunge scene put it on the map. And so all of a sudden it was like it was becoming hipster cool. Seattle was like, so Sleepless in Seattle, I understand why they did the movie, you know. And then Mrs. Doubtfire was the other one. More Robin Williams. Can't go wrong. I know. I know. It's totally weird. I can't believe that I did that. Again, we had a child in the house and it's like, I remember that we kind of, you know, had some of these going so that she would join us, you know, and we watched it together and stuff. Uh, the guy's a genius. He was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and on my walk, man, okay. I had Pretty in Pink. Oh, and, fantastic. Uh, because, yeah. Yeah. Because Pretty in Pink actually had OMD, you know, if you leave. And it was like, again, it was that sort of ABC time, you know, mm -hmm. Nick Kershaw, Psychedelic wow. Furs, oh. Echo and the Bunny Man. <laughs> Those John Hughes soundtracks were just as good as the films themselves. I mean, they were as intrinsic to the storytelling and what we remember of the feeling of it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and it was like it. really, yeah, synth driven. And it was just, I was kind of saturated in all of that for Boy Meets Girl. It was such an Anglophile, John Hughes was, I think. He loved all that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, yeah. 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 I have to say, though, you know, in going over your question, because we got a sneak preview <laughs> of it, <laughs> I ended yeah, yeah. up going back and listening to the Big Chill soundtrack. Oh, my gosh. And then I watched the movie again yesterday. I thought, oh, I haven't watched that since it came out. You know, so I watched The Big Chill and just listened to the music. And it's so much fun. But that was, was like nah. early 80s, I think. So oh, great choices. <laughs> great choices all around. It was, it was a fun question. First, I went, it oh, was. I can't answer that. But you we did. It. did it. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, George, thank you for chatting with me. I've had a lovely time hearing all about your amazing career. There's so much more I could have gone in. We could do it parts two and three. I'm up for it. Thank you. You can do part <laughs> two and three anytime. <laughs> Sending a huge thanks to Shannon and George of Boy Meets Girl for such a great chat here on the Straight to Video podcast. After such a long career, I love seeing and hearing their passion and love for music is equally alive to this day, and I'm excited to hear what they do next. Make sure to check out their website, boymeetsgirlmusic.com, if you enjoyed our talk. So Halloween is once again upon us, and this coming Monday, the 30th of October, we'll be teaming up once again with the Loft Movie Theatre for another Halloween screening. This time, I can't wait to see The Return of the Living Dead at the Savoy Cinema in Nottingham, one of my all-time favourite films, which gets better every time I watch it, and I've never seen it on the big screen, so I'm totally pumped for this one. Tickets are on sale now, so I hope to see you early next week. So that's all for this episode, but I'll be back next Friday. But until then, have a great Halloween, and remember, always be kind, please rewind and unwind, and I'll speak to you all real soon. <laughs>